Testing, you hear it? Testing one. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. Testing one, two. I don't hear you. Testing. Shalom Aleichem. Welcome. Baruch HaMaboyim. B'Shem Hashem. Welcome one and all to this extraordinary event as we prepare for Gimel Tamos, the 30th anniversary, Hilula of our beloved Rebbe. Even as we stand very close to the very special day of Chav Ches Sivan, the 28th of Sivan, beginning tomorrow night, which is the day on which the Rebbe and the Rebetzin miraculously came to these shores, surviving Nazi Germany, and the rest is history. Friends, I want to thank the uh, leadership of the OL here, Rabbi Refsin and his team, even as they're preparing to host more than 50,000 people on Gimel Tamuz uh, for making this possible. Also thanking the leadership of Tzach, of Tzirah Agudas Chabad, Labavitch Youth Organization, uh, who are sponsoring this event uh, with the leadership of Rabbi Telden, Rabbi Baumgarten, Rabbi Castell, Rabbi Butman. May God give him a speedy recovery. And uh, also the shluchim of the metro area, many shluchim from New York City, from our own beloved Long Island, from New Jersey. I understand there's an entire delegation from Teaneck. <laughs> Quite extraordinary. And um, of course, from Comac, and uh, throughout the entire area, getting together. This is actos, unity, of so many people in so many Chabad houses throughout the five boroughs and beyond, New Jersey, etc., and including, of course, a Long Island. I want to also thank Chabad.org on behalf of the organizers for running this live stream. If you have friends that are home that you want to tip them off that this is going on live stream, uh, just let them know. It's on apparently the main page of Chabad.org as we speak as we gather for this special time, 30 years and the 83rd anniversary of Chav Ches Sivan. Friends, somebody once asked the Rebbe, he was a friend of Chabad in England, incidentally our guest speaker tonight is from England, and uh, this particular person was not a Chabad chassid, uh, was a businessman who traveled and he happened to be in uh, the States on business and his Chabad friend, the well-known, famous Chassid Rabbi Sion Shem Tov of blessed memory, said, you must go see my Rebbe. And he said, you know, you're my Rebbe. You're my Rebbe. I have to go see a Rebbe in Brooklyn. He didn't understand what, what is the Rebbe to him. And Rabbi Shem Tov said to him, listen, do me a favor. Don't be a fool. You're in the States already. You're on business. Give a skip and a hop over to Brooklyn to visit the Rebbe, we'll arrange a Yechidus and audience. So he agreed. But he literally was going as a, a salute to his friend and to his friendship. He walks into the Rebbe's room in the middle of the night for Yechidus, and, uh, and he says, hello. I don't know exactly the conversation, but apparently he just stood there awkwardly, and the Rebbe said to him, Nu, do you have any questions? People come here with questions. And he said, no. I really don't. Uh, you, you want a blessing? No. So the Rebbe said, so why are you here? He said, Shem Tov told me to come. So the Rebbe broke out with a big smile. And the Rebbe said, maybe there's something you might want to ask. Maybe you can think of a question. And he says, you know what? I have one question if you're pushing me. Rebbe, tell me, what are you? Like, what's this whole fuss about a Rebbe? You know, I know rabbis, they're scholars. We have rabbis in our community all over the world. But what's the, what are you? What is a Rebbe? And the Rebbe looked him deep in the eye and gave him a warm smile. And the Rebbe said, a friend. A friend. And as the Rebbe says that, he's thinking to himself, that's it? That's the whole big deal? I got a bunch of friends. That's the reason people are schlepping from all over the world. And that's why Rabbi Shem Tov insisted that I come and I have to make an appointment at 2, 3 in the morning to visit a friend. And as he's thinking this, the Rebbe is sort of narrating what's going through his mind, and he says, but I want to explain to you what type of friend. 
a friend who cares about you unconditionally, a friend with whom you can share anything and everything, the good and the bad and the ugly, and they will never have any judgment whatsoever, regardless of what they know about you, with the same love and the same dedication. And the Rebbe looks at him, how many friends like that do you know? And he said, you know, that type of friend is actually almost impossible to come by. So I opened this evening with that statement because I myself, I'm a shliach in the Chabad house about 45 minutes away and I often bring people here. And my message to them is you're not going to a Rebbe, you're going to your Rebbe. You're not just going to a righteous person and someone extraordinary and a great soul. You're going to a friend. You're going to a soul that God gifted our generation to which we are all connected and linked. And actually this is more about making each of us shine than about celebrating the Rebbe's greatness. The Rebbe's greatness is well known, but what the Rebbe wants more importantly is for each of us to know our own greatness, our own potential, and bring this out. This is your Rebbe. This is why we are here. And I expressed this once to a group. I was visiting this, the Ohel on a busy morning, and as I'm running into the first tent, I see a Chabad Shliach from Boston University, a good friend of mine, and uh, he's with a group of students. And he calls me over, he says, Shalom Aisha, come, say something to my group. It's the first time that they're coming to the Rebbe. And I was in a rush. I didn't really have the time. I didn't really have any ideas what to tell them. But how can I refuse a friend of mine? So I run over to the table. There's about 15 or 20 students. And I say, uh, welcome. They say, tell us about the Rebbe. So I say, where are you guys from? Boys and girls. And they say, we're from BU. I said, that's it. That's what the Rebbe is all about. BU. Each of us has a soul. Each of us has a mission. It's all connected collectively. And the Rebbe is that giant soul that brings it out in us and polishes us. So as we enjoy tonight's speakers and programs, and there's a lot of wonderful surprises, please think about how this is going to make you be a better you. Polish ourselves to make ourselves proud and make the Rebbe proud and ultimately make Hashem proud. Friends, at this time, there's a very big surprise. Someone very prominent has joined us. And for this segment, I'm going to invite my colleague from uh, one of the Chabad houses in Queens, which is well represented here tonight, Rabbi Mendy Hecht, to make this introduction. Please welcome Rabbi Hecht. Good evening. And um, thank you, Rabbi Paltil, for your uh, beautiful words. I just want to say we have a special guest here tonight who is actually um, someone who is, is part of the Queens, the Queens Borough, not just part, the Borough President of Queens, <laughs> Donovan Richards Jr., who is with us tonight, that being here at the Rebbe's Eichel at such an auspicious occasion um, definitely, uh, definitely makes a lot of sense. And um, we're, we're honored to have you. I just want to say um, that the Borough President, Donovan Richards, has uh, been very, very, um, a, a very close friend to the Shluchim of Queens, and um, now for, for many years. And um, he has participated, and not just participated, but actually goes out of his way um, I have to say, you know, I know many big people out there and sometimes we, we try to arrange to, to get them to come and I know people are busy and, and there's a lot going on, but the borough president always goes out of his way to answer our, the shluchim's request to either be there by a Hanukkah menorah lighting um, in Queens or by a special, actually, Gimel Tamas gathering. Um, this is not the first one he's, he's gathered for um, in Queens for the shluchim and and for many different uh, occasions, especially um, yearly for the Rebbe's birthday, Yud Alf Nissen, he doesn't suffice with just honoring the Rebbe with a proclamation, but he, he, he really goes out of his way to make sure the proclamation is given on the day of the Rebbe's birthday because he realizes it's so important. And we've had multiple times where we met up with the borough president for that occasion as well. Um, I just want to say um, that it's our honor to have you and Please, without further ado, please 
give us uh, your um, important words. Well, good evening, and thank you to, of course, our rabbis, uh, respected dignitaries, of course, all of you, even, even some of y'all from New Jersey, we welcome you here uh, to Queens County because Queens County is open to everyone, but thank God there's no congestion pricing, so I'm sure you all are happy about that. Got a few claps here on that. But let me say it is a privilege of the highest order to represent this borough, the most diverse county in the United States, Queens County, and of course to be here to mark the 30th anniversary of the Rebbe's anniversary and passing. And of course, I have some great friends, and I want to thank Rabbi Shmuel Butman for convening us, Rabbi Refson, thank you for hosting us, Rabbi Mindy Heck, all of you have been advocates and such good friends to me uh, since I've assumed the office of borough president in November of 2020. And of course, I uh, know the actual date. Uh, the Rebbe's yard site is July 9th, when visitors all from around the world will pay their respects right here at Oho. And as many of you know, not only do I represent this borough, this great borough, but I feel blessed every night and every morning I wake up because I live three blocks from here. And what's significant about that, what I will say is, you know, today is the anniversary also of the Civil Rights Act being signed into law, and I'm reminded always of the strong bond between the Jewish community and black community in moving this country forward, and we must never let that bond be divided. So I can stand here as a first black man to be borough president in Queens because, yes, there were some Jewish brothers and sisters who also were freedom fighters who, who also lost their lives in that battle. So I thank them for this opportunity to be here. And I'm also proud because, you know, as I came in, my first event as borough president was our menorah lighting ceremony at Queensborough Hall. And I want you to know that we're going a, fur a step further. We have been working with the Queens Jewish Community Council uh, because we, when we say never forget, we really mean we will never, ever forget. And we're working on actually um, building a memorial in remembrance of all of those we lost on the Holocaust on the grounds of my office because we will never forget those who perished. So I truly believe the Rebbe of blessed memory would praise our partnership on Hanukkah, the festival of lights when the menorah candles glow in front of Borough Hall, the people's house lighting everyone's path. And I offer this image to you because it connects to the very occasion that brings us all here tonight. The Lubavitcher Rebbe taught that every Jewish person and every human being carries a unique spark, which leads them to perform acts of kindness in the world. In this spirit, I hope you know that as long as I am your borough president, you have a trusted friend at Queensboro Hall, whether in times of celebration or struggle. And I, of course, have been concerned about the safety and well-being of our Jewish brothers since October 7th. It's one of the reasons why I uh, organized, even as many did not know what happened. And I was actually leaving for Israel the next day. We were bringing a group, a coalition of diverse people from Queens County because we want everyone to understand that Israel is a democracy, that Israel is a friend of the United States, but more important to enlighten people to break down those silos and those walls of ignorance. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't make that trip. Unfortunately, it was canceled. But we stood in solidarity. I organized a rally the following day in Kew Gardens to send a strong message to also let my Jewish brothers and sisters know that we are here for you during your time of need. And of course, I've carried that dark cloud of October 7th with me ever since. And we will continue to say, free the hostages. And I just don't say that lightly. I traveled to Israel, uh, I believe, in October, uh, right after 
and during, well, not even after, during the war, we traveled to the border. We went to kibbutz. We saw the harm, the stench of death in many corners. We spoke with families whose family members were taken hostage. We met with those who were displaced as well. So I want you to know our highest priority here is to make sure we continue to stand with you during this difficult time. I know it's been really rough to celebrate many things this year. And we'll continue to stand against anti-Semitism in every fashion and form, whether it's on a college campus or whether it's on the streets. We will fight against anti-Semitism in this borough. It is my understanding that the Jewish tradition places great value on the anniversary of an individual's passing because it is a time we can learn from their accomplishments and celebrate their legacy. Tonight, we feel the spe spiritual presence of the Rebbe with special fervor. We know that his unique spark continues in the good work of his emissaries throughout the world and right here in the borough of Queens. I want to take this opportunity to present a proclamation which was originally prepared for education and sharing day in honor of the Rebbe's birthday. We were unable to gather earlier this year, so I requested my staff to ensure that every Chabad in Queens received a copy. And I'll just read the last paragraph of this proclamation, which reads, whereas the 2.4 million residents of the borough of Queens wholeheartedly join in this year's commemoration of education and sharing day. USA, as we pursue the Rebbe's goal of helping all children receive an education well, that, that will help them succeed in all facets of life. May we all draw inspiration from the legacy of the Rebbe, a blessed memory, and share this light with the borough of Queens and the world. May God be with each and every one of you. And I will now ask you to come up and receive this proclamation. Shalom. Thank you all. I just want to present to the board president um, a beautiful book. You know, we, we've given to the borough president um, over the years different things. And um, the borough president, I don't know if you know, in his office he has a charity box screwed into the wall of his office that he gives charity um, in there. Um, he also has um, a beautiful sitter a Sidura, a prayer book uh, on his desk. And um, this is another beautiful thing in honor of the 30th um, um, uh, passing anniversary of Baba Treba, blessed memory, a beautiful book from Rabbi Joseph Telushkin.
about the Rebbe. May this inspire you and give you strength to continue doing all the wonderful work, work you do, and you should be blessed to continue doing what you do as the board president. We, like we say in Hebrew, Michael Ochel, from strength to strength. Thank you so much. Quite extraordinary. Mr. Borough President, I'll have you know that the Rebbe would say to elected officials, including the mayor of New York and the governor of New York, you are my mayor, you are my leader, you are the borough president of the OHEL. You. you represent what the world will look like very soon when Mashiach comes. I want to mention uh, that uh, there are programs on the seats, but not every seat. There may not be enough. Thankfully, uh, more people than uh, expected. So uh, when the program is over, these wonderful booklets, tributes to the Rebbe will be um, available on the refreshment tables on the sides as well. Friends, you know, something they taught us in rabbi school, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I have now the privilege of introducing a senior colleague, a rabbi, a well-respected rabbi, who knows and cares, Rabbi Kasriel Castell, who's been working for Lubavitch Youth Organization as its program director since 1967. That's a long time ago. That's the year that I had my bris, incidentally. And uh, been a mentor and a friend to all of us. And he's going to give some greetings, as well as lead us in the Rebbe and Rebbe since Tehillim chapter uh, for the benefit of the people in Israel and the soldiers. Those chapters are found on the back side of this program. Please welcome Rabbi Castell. Firstly, we will say the Tehillim, the, the, the Psalms, uh, the, the Rebbe's of year and the Rebbe's year, I want to ask everyone to please rise. Shir Hamalois, Elech on Ososius, Ainai, Yeshre Bashamoyim, Hine, Kaine Avodim, Alyad Adenehem, Kaine Shivcho, Alyad Givirto, Kaine Nenu, El Adenoya Lehenu, Aj Yehonenu. Honeinu, Adonai Honeinu, Yirav Savanu Vuz, Rav Asobolon Hashenu Alaga Shananim, Abuz Lege Yoinim, Shir Hamalos Ladovid, Lule Adonai Shahoyalonu Yeman Yisrael, Lule Adonai Shahoyalonu Kumalenu Adom, Azai Chayim Vlaunu, Bachrazum Abombonu, Azai Mainstafunu, Nachlo of Al Narshenu, Azai of Al Narshenu Hamayim Azodinim, Baruch had a noise alone, so no terrible to him. Now she could see, but Nimlot of Bach Yoksim, a Bach Nishbar, Vanach Num Lotnu, as Rain Rubushem of the Noi, Ose Shamayim Vorets. Please be seated. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you this evening for an evening of inspiration. We are, we're coming at an auspicious place, an auspicious time, with the purpose of hoping to go away inspired, as the Rebbe would say, from every opportunity to come out stronger and healthier and, and grow from each experience. And therefore, um, we're here in a special place near the Ohel, a special time as you prepare for the for the for the uh, your site and as we gain to, to here we're hoping something is good is going to come out of this meaning 
we'll, many of us, or hopefully all of us, will have an opportunity to also go into the Ohel and to ask for blessings for whatever it is that you need. Blessings for good health, for parnosa, for livelihood, for shiduchim, for those who need it, for children, who those who need it, and healthy and health, happy children and family, etc. all the things that we're praying for. But the tradition is that when you go to ask, it's not only give me, give me, give me. We're asking for prayers, I need, I need. We also, the Jewish way is, yes, I need, but God, I'm giving. I'm, gonna do, I'm going to be doing something to be deserving of that blessing. And that's really, what, to a degree, what we're here for. We're hoping that this evening we'll, people will hear some special words of encouragement and be able to go away somehow stronger than they were so that when they come in to ask God for the blessings for all the things that we need, we can say to God, God, I'll give you this, you give me that. It's a Jewish way of doing business, right? <laughs> I need the blessing, you want, you want the, all the mitzvahs, I'll be glad to in in increase, and I'm hoping God should be able to increase as well. It's a, t a time when people are coming really from all over the world to be here with the Rebbe. Yeah, okay. And at, the time when that, at that time, we're all gathered tonight from, from here, to, from all parts of New York, but really this is part of a, a major thing where you're going to see next in a, few, in a few days, you won't be able to get into this place. I don't know if you'll be able to get into Queens, but, but, uh, but hopefully that we're, that's what we're really have coming here, to be inspired, to hear some words from words from, from seniors, uh, Hasidim, from others who can share words that will perhaps be able to touch us. And I want to thank you for, all co for coming and welcome. Thank you, Rabbi Castell. At this point, they're going to play a little clip of uh, the Rebbe singing the famous Tzama, one of the songs the Rebbe taught to the words of Psalm, Tzama Lecha Nafshi, that my soul thirsts to you. The Rebbe would sing it from time to time. Uh, you never knew when it's going to happen. Obviously, it was a moment when the Rebbe expressed the tzaddik, the thirst of a tzaddik to be close to Hashem, which ultimately means Mashiach. And the Hasidim would join and sing in tandem. Clearly, at this point in time, more than ever, uh, as a Jewish world, and we feel that need to be close to Hashem, to see Mashiach, to see the revelation of uh, a world of goodness and kindness. And uh, as Hasidim also, to be together with the Rebbe and all our righteous loved ones. So uh, we'll join along. Tzama Lecha Nafshi.
Friends, at this time, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing an awesome colleague. You know, they asked the question, what's the difference between a rabbi and a salesman? Did you ever think about that? What's the difference between a rabbi and a salesman? The salesman sells you something you want, but you don't really need. The rabbi sells you something you need, but you don't really want. This is a gentleman who uh, certainly a salesman par excellence and a rabbi par excellence, Rabbi Dov Yonah Korn, who has served as a shliach of the Rebbe for 26 years in Greenwich Village, together with his wife, Sarah, focusing on NYU and other local colleges and young professionals. And uh, they have an exceptional team of supporters and members and leaders, and they built a world-famous Jewish life center in a um, historied Bowery Street. As you will see, this is a dynamic speaker. You're going to have fun. It's allowed. It's kosher to enjoy a Jewish event. Uh, this is a young man on the front lines of the battle for Jewish pride on American college campuses. Be prepared to take a ride with him on his own personal odyssey and journey to Yiddishkeit and to the Rebbe. His topic, what brought me to the Rebbe and where it is taking me now. Please join me to welcome Rabbi Dov Yonah Cohen. Hello. I think I have a response. Hello, everybody. Yeah. All right. L'chaim. It was a rainy night. Sitting in a car outside in Morristown, New Jersey, in front of the yeshiva. I was 16 years old. My uncle, who was a Chabad follower, had brought me to the yeshiva under a false pretext. He said he was going to go buy his daughter a prayer book. I said I was not interested in coming in. Pre previous to this, a few years earlier, I decided that I wanted to go on a journey to find the meaning of life. I grew up in a very secular Jewish home. I had a bar mitzvah, but it was more bar than mitzvah. Thank you. And I was a profession, a professional actor. I was present in my class. My mother was grooming me to go to Cornell with the rest of her family. And I had a very strong secular path ahead of me. But I started to question, what's the purpose of life? Just to make money and have all the things that I wanted to have? Is that enough? So when I was 15 years old, I began studying other religions and listening to the music of the hippies and expanding my mind. And I asked my parents to let me drop out of school. I'm the only child to my mother who dreamt of the Ivy League college as my uh, destination, and here I am leaving. She took me to a therapist, as well she should have. The therapist said, he's not rebelling. He has questions about life that you cannot answer. So I left 15 years old, and I went to every religious institution. I studied Christianity and Buddhism and Hinduism and Rastafarianism, and I followed the Grateful Dead, and I lived with hippies. And I, I, I went to each place thirsty and questioning and searching. I did not think to go anywhere Jewish. I was underwhelmed by my reform Jewish experience, and I thought the Orthodox, let alone the Hasidic, were way out of my league and closed-minded. So here I am, in this car, outside of the yeshiva in Morristown, sitting with a full outfit of patchwork color. I have dreadlocks, and they're being held together by a purple knit Rastafarian headpiece. And I'm going by the name Butterfly. That was my moniker. Butterfly. And I'm sitting in this car outside the yeshiva, and a little voice inside me, inside me says, go inside. Okay. I'll give it a shot. I walk up to the door of the yeshiva. I look inside. I see 200 men at a long table with vodka and pickles and singing and celebrating and, and beautiful song. I walked into a Yud Tes Kislev for bringing. And the whole room looks at me because I walk in like the circus walked in. 
I found out that this was about Shuva Yeshiva, Yeshiva for people that did not grow up religious. And within a few moments, Rabbi Avraham Lipsker, may he live and be well, came over to me. He said to me, what's your name? I said, my name is Butterfly. <laughs> he said, what's your Jewish name? I said, something, Yona, Dove, Yona, something I wasn't sure. He embraced me deeply and said to me, welcome home. I said, take it easy, big man. I'm not home. He said, come. Let's talk. Let's bring. I, I spent the night there till 6 a.m. I'm not going to do the entire, this whole story is a different, uh, longer speech, but... Once I settled into Yiddishkeit, into Judaism, I told my mother, I'm ready to go to yeshiva full time. My mother said, oh, please, God, go to yeshiva university at least. You were a good student. We're back in college. Let's go. Yes. So I started yeshiva university. I went to them a few days, to their credit, a few days before school started. And I said, you have to take me. Trust me. You need me. And so they accepted me, and, and we began. I shaved off my, my hair, and I wore a suit. And at this point, I thought everyone was Chabad. <clears throat> I, I didn't know. I, I found Yeshiva University back then. This is 28 years ago. It's less Hasidic than it is now. It was a little tight for me. And everybody was so different. There was not that Hasidic energy. Everyone was wearing a lot of ties. And everything seemed very proper. And not with that loose warmth. So I started going to the Chabad Yeshiva half a week. But what I was missing was not just the Chabad warmth. And it wasn't just the Hasidic ideology that I'm crazy about. But I have to be honest, what I was missing was the Rebbe. This individual had captured me as a young, thirsty, searching young Jew. Something I didn't realize at the time. But I, I, when, I, when, I, when I was in Yeshiva University, I said, what is, what's drawing me back to Chabad? It was the Rebbe. Why? A few reasons. Number one is, the Rebbe is a revolutionary, a disruptor. And I felt that. As a young Jew, I felt this man is not here for status quo. He's not here for institutional protection. He wants something new. There's an incredible talk of the Rebbe's where he speaks about the power of youth. And he says there's something shocking. He says that the youth may do things so um, outlandish that the, the elders have to step aside to not get in the way of the power of the youth. That's the statement of a disruptor, of a revolutionary. And I felt that. Number two is the Rebbe is not just a revolutionary against Jewish institutionalism, but against human mediocrity. The Rebbe said to be a human means to be a global citizen. Life isn't about just getting by and being happy. It's about holding ourselves to a higher standard of mission. And that moved me. Number three is that the Rebbe is the most practical mystic I've ever seen in my life. Such a mystic and so practical. I've met entrepreneurs. I've met mystics. But to see the blending of deep spirituality and pr the most practical execution shocked me the time and continues to do so. And finally, and the most important, the Rebbe's teachings and the Rebbe's leadership, of, uh, evolution of the Rebbe's leadership said something to me then and it still says it to me now. It says, this is not our Judaism that we are welcoming you back to. This is your Judaism. This is not, well, we are the institution and welcome and, and welcome home. That's true. It's beautiful. No, no, no. What the Rebbe is saying is deeper. He's saying, will you welcome us home? We're giving you the keys. I mean this. We are giving you, young Jew, walking, hi, young butterfly, welcome. Here are the keys to the kingdom. We need you to take all of us home. And maybe my gigantic ego, thank God I'm a megalomaniac, the great, the great ego in me, but also the depth of my hope and prayer and wish to do something with my life, I heard the Rebbe's call. The Rebbe said, Dov Yaina, we need you. And I was innocent enough and uh, unschooled in, uh, in, in religious institutionalism, and I listened. What I want to tell you today here at this little gathering, this Fabringen, is that I have a Rebbe. And people say, oh, I never met the Rebbe, not once in my life. And people say, how, is it, how do you connect with this man that passed away? 
it's not, not only is it a concept in Judaism about the tz- passing of a tzaddik and how, how, uh, how we can connect to the righteous, and it's a con- concept in Hasidic ideology, and the Rebbe spoke about it so much, about the previous Rebbe, how we can connect with the righteous and at, the, at, the, at the Ohel, at their rest, resting place, and learning their teachings, and in general. But I want to tell you something. I'm not worried about how vibrant and present the Rebbe is. I'm worried about how vibrant and present I am. Let's not worry about the Rebbe. The Rebbe's fine. Let's not worry about how available and how accessible the Rebbe is. It's there for our taking. The question is, how much do we want to take advantage of it? And I will tell you that, that Baruch Hashem, I'm a very normal guy, and I have a Rebbe. And it's, I'm sharing with you from my heart this holy occasion. Baruch Hashem, thank God Almighty for sending me the Rebbe. So when my wife and I got married... I, she, I met at a Grateful Dead concert, and that story is its own for bringing. But when my wife and I got married, there was no question we would go on shlichus. We would open a Chabad house, even though there are many, many ways to embody these ideals. But for us, we wanted to go, as we say, hardcore. Little did we know what we were signing up for. I wouldn't give it up for anything, but it's definitely been, uh, I, have le- l- I have less hair on the top of my head and more gray ones on my face than I thought I'd have at this age. But throughout this process, Baruch Hashem, we've been driven by the Rebbe's leadership and the Rebbe's vision, the Rebbe's faith in not just us, but in every Jew we meet. And people ask us, How, where does your success come from? And I'll be honest, and you can bring in any student from our Chabad, they'll, they'll say it too. Whatever the Rebbe made us feel, we make them feel. This is yours. This is your Chabad house. Don't ever, if you say it's Rabbi and Sarah's Chabad house, we get furious. This is your Chabad house. And I want to say it to everybody here. The, the future of the Jewish people is in your hands. The future of the Chabad movement is in your hands, in our hands. And our ability to ask this incredible Rebbe, this tzaddik, this leader to direct us and guide us is real and authentic. So this, the, the end of my talk here, my short talk, is to tell you where I'm trying to go from here. Can you just uh, shut off my alarm? I'm supposed to, rem- it's a reminder that tonight's for bringing is in memory of Yitzhak Mordechai ben Chaim, my brother-in-law. Just turn it off. I want to remember to say it, but I, I remember too late. As powerful as what the Reb has done to the Jewish world and where the Reb has led us and how we've, we've courageously been schlepped along to believe in a world, Jewishly, the way it is today, in the world, the Chabad world, the way it is today, no one 60, 70 years could ever imagine such a, such a vision. So, too, is where the Rebbe's always been trying to push us towards, where the Torah is pushing us towards, is towards the future, towards Mashiach. And it's crazy, just as crazy as it is, if you would tell someone in 1955 there's going to be thousands upon thousands of shluchim and chabad houses, no one could have believed. So too is it crazy for us to imagine a world where God Almighty is fully revealed. It's crazy. It's very hard, let's be honest. The Jewish people came to Moses and Moses said they, 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 Moses, Moses came to the Jewish people and they couldn't believe him because they were so fatigued. It's hard for us to imagine such an incredible world. And here's the Rebbe's message. The, the shluchim aren't just creating a reality. We're responding to a reality. What's going on in the world is happening inside the world. The Rebbe says the world is changing. And we have the opportunity to respond to that change. So getting ready for Mashiach isn't just about thinking about something in the future. The Rebbe said it's already begun. We have the opportunity to start to feel and act differently now because of where we stand in Jewish history. I know it's hard looking at what's going on in Eretz Israel, And Hashem should bless all the Chayalim and the Shavuim and all the Jewish Jewish people of, of our holy land. And we don't understand exactly how that fits into the beautiful future that we're going towards, but we know that it does. We have two opportunities to help bring to the future, and this is where I stand as a chassid, I'm not done. I didn't come here for this. I didn't come here to have a Chabad house and be famous. I, didn't, I came here for Mashiach. That's what sold me. That's why I became from. I'm sorry. I became religious because I want Mashiach. That's, I came in Tavshin Nun Dalad a few years after, uh, I'm sorry, Nun Hay, right after Gimel Thomas, but on, on the fire of the Rebbe's Mashiach campaign. And we have to hold ourselves, hold ourselves to a new experience, an experience in living in a world that's changed. 
A, by doing more good deeds, even small deeds, even the smallest of deeds can make a massive impact, number one. And number two is by trying to live with a different mentality, a little bit more confidence, a little bit more pride in who we are, a little bit more faith that we can accomplish things that we couldn't accomplish 100 years ago. Because I can promise that we can. And my organization is a part of it. And all of the organizations that are here is part, are a part of it. And all the incredible things happening in the Jewish world are a part of it. And the Rebbe says many things that are happening in the non-Jewish world are a part of it. So may God bless each and every one of us here. Let's all sit up a little bit. Let's get some good body language. Sit up. Yep. Straighten up. Yeah. Let's, let's ask... For the Rebbe's brachas here at the Holy Ohel, let's ask for mercy from God Almighty that the Jewish people should be ready to finally listen to the Rebbe's ultimate leadership, that we should walk into a new, the brightest hour of the Jew Jewish people we've ever seen. And please, God, it should be led by you and by you and by you and by you and by you as is everything is in Judaism and by me also. And it should be with mercy and kindness that everybody here should have all the blessings they need and everything material and spiritual and we should have Mashiach now. behalf of the organizers tonight, we want to thank Jem. Thank you. We want to thank Jem for uh, actually previewing this brand new film this evening. Uh, this was just created for Gimel Tammuz, Shnas Ashleishim for the 30th year, and uh, was previewed tonight, uh, advance ahead of schedule for its production, so we want to thank them. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to welcome our guest speaker, and I'd like to ask those in the back to come forward. There are seats on the front. As I like to say in my shul, if you're sitting in the cheap seats, come on down. Uh, let's, uh, let's give people a minute to come forward, and uh, this is going to be very special. This is a very special treat, so uh, I encourage you to come forward and be comfortable. So some of you may have heard from your shaluchim that there was a famous chassid of the Alta Rebbe, the first Rebbe by the name of Shmuel Munkus, who was uh, an extraordinary person, but also very humorous, and uh, he served Hashem with joy, and let's just call it with tongue-in-cheek at times. And uh, one of the stories is that one day they come to the court of the Alta Rebbe, you know, the then 770, and they see this chassid, Rab Shmuel, hanging from the, uh, from the windows, from the bars. I don't know what they had out there. Hanging at the bars outside the shul. I said, Rab Shmuel, Mr. Meshigir, like, what's going on? You're hanging outside. And he said, uh, don't you get it? When you go to the shoemaker, they hang a shoe. When you go to the locksmith, they hang a key. This is our product. When you go to the Rebbe, aha, we hang a chassid. This is the product of the Rebbe. So... You know, there are many Hasidim and many people that can speak to us eloquently and many scholars. But the Hasid that I have the pleasure of bringing to this podium now is someone, uh, to many of us, is an example of a true Hasid, not just a scholar, not just someone who had the special zchus and merit to have personal connections over the years. I believe the Rebbe made a shidduch, the Rebbe did his chuppah, the Rebbe was, he had a personal relationship with the Rebbe's mother, and the Rebbe's in Chayimushka, I believe, and it goes on and on and on, of course, being a shliach for more than 50 years. But beyond all of that, someone who we can look to as not just someone who knows Chassidus, who knows Rebbe, who knows what to say, but lives it and embodies it. And uh, it's extraordinarily uh, special to have him here. Uh, this is uh, a veteran shliach, beloved and respected by Chabad and beyond all over the world, an international uh, visiting lecturer in all over the world, and he's on the directorate of uh, Overstavad, the committee overseeing Chabad Lubavitch institutions throughout the UK, uh, Rabbi Shmuel Lu, on the topic of what is a Rebbe and why do we need one. Please help me in welcoming Rabbi Shmuel Lu.
evening. This has been a most fascinating experience for me to be with the hundreds of people here, inspired about the Rebbe and about oneself. And I would like to give a bracha to every single one of you to be able to find fulfillment, success, in the way that you would have your greatest, wildest expectations, and more. What is a Rebbe? You know, in my day job, I'm a principal of a high school. And a couple of years ago, the end of the year, this time, it was just before the Rebbe's anniversary, we had a little Fabrengen in the senior class. And I said, ask whatever you want. And there's this senior girl from a Chabad family, very Hasidic girl, and she says, why do I need a Rebbe? Which is not the kind of a question you expect from someone of that background. And I said, number one, I congratulate you for the courage to ask the question that you want to understand. The only question which is unacceptable is the one that you don't ask. Why do you need a Rebbe? And in order to answer it, I want to tell you a story. This story happened in England. A few years before my wife and I arrived there on Schlichus, I'm originally a Brooklyn boy. And Rabbi Sudak, our shliach, told me this story. There was a lady who was very ill, an Orthodox woman. Nobody knew about Chabad. Very few knew about the Rebbe. And he told her, write a letter to the Rebbe to get a blessing. And she wrote, and she got a response, and she got advice and blessing, and miraculously, she was cured. Now, her rabbi was a very, very orthodox man, was brought up in a non-Hasidic milieu. And he had a major question about the whole advice of telling somebody to write to somebody overseas about a problem you have. And he asked a question which was, there is a story in the Torah about Hagar and Yishmael, the mother and the son, and the son was very sick. And they prayed to God. And Torah says, Vayishma Elokim El Kolhanar. God listened to the prayer of the boy. And the foremost commentary is Rashi, and he says, This teaches us that the prayer of somebody who is ill is more effective than somebody else davening for them. So he said, Why tell this woman? to write a letter, in those days there weren't many practical ways of communicating, just to send a letter overseas, it takes five, six days, another five, six days back. Why didn't you just tell her to say some more prayers, some more to heal him? And somehow this question reached the Rebbe himself. Maybe it was in a report, I don't know how. how. And the Rebbe said, that the idea of asking a rabbi to pray on your behalf to Hashem is not an innovation of Chabad, and it's not something that the Hasidic movement instituted. It goes back thousands of years. We find it in the Talmud. The Gemara says that if there is somebody sick in your house, yeleich etzel hechacham. Go to the Chacham, to the sage, to the tzaddik, to the wise person. And that's the custom of going to a rebbe. 
But now you have a question about a contradiction between the Gemara. The Gemara says that you should go to the tzaddik. And Rashi says, better the prayer of the sick person than for somebody else. And the answer to that question is that a Rebbe is not somebody else. The Rebbe is the person themselves. The word Rebbe is a, an acronym, a Rosh Tevos. Rosh B'nai Yisrael, the head of the Jewish people. What is the function of the head in the body? If a person wants to, the head cannot do what the body can do. If you want to go somewhere, you have to walk on your legs. If you want to give something, you have to use your hands. The head cannot give, the head cannot walk. On the other hand, you can be the most fit, athletic person with powerful legs and powerful hands and everything else. But if there's something, God forbid, wrong in the brain, for example, a person has a stroke, it affects even the strongest body. In other words, a Rebbe is like the central nervous system of the configuration of the Jewish people of that generation. So you need a Rebbe not because you have to give something to somebody else. In order for you to be able to function at your full capacity, we all operate at a fraction of our real capabilities. Because every person within their neshama, the Kabbalah explains, the Talmud says that there are five names to the soul. The Kabbalah and Hasidic teachings explain that there are five levels of animation, of, vi of, of vibrancy, of living, which the neshama represents. And we very rarely can touch. There are thousands and thousands, I told this girl, thousands of people who are totally, absolutely from in everything they do. But if they don't have a Rebbe, I promise you, they are not living up to their own innermost self. Having a Rebbe is an opportunity that Hashem gave us to be able to reach the deepest reservoirs that are there within ourselves. As my friend and a student, one of my, when I first came to England, one of the first students I met was somebody called Jonathan Sachs. I'm sure most of you heard of him. And he went to the rabbi. I arranged for many students to go and have private audiences between 1968 and 1970, around then, when this was acceptable. And he said that I took a tour. He applied for a scholarship to study Jewish leadership in America. And he went to Orthodox, he went to Rabbi Soloveitchik, and he went to Professor Heschel, and he went to Cincinnati, he went to Nahum Goldman, who was a secular uh, Jewish leader. And everywhere he heard about the Rebbe, so he went to the Rebbe also, we arranged it. And he said, in every single person I met, you could sense their greatness. He said, the Rebbe forced you to look at your own greatness. His leadership was in making a person appreciate what they themselves were and what they had within them. So a Rebbe is, besides everything else that the Rebbe is as a Rebbe, in order to achieve that status. But the, in, in, in relation to oneself, the Rebbe is someone that gives you access to your own inner self. And that is why people who are connected to the Rebbe have achieved so much. 
because the, the, this connection in itself brought out within themselves. Now you might ask, that was good 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, maybe when the memory was fresh, 30, 25 years ago. Now 30 years have passed. What's the connection? And as the Rebbe himself said, this connection is stronger, more vibrant, more real than ever before. Because the way to connect to a Rebbe is not in the conventional way that you meet someone. We just had the story in this past week's Sedra, in the Pashat HaShavua. The story of the 12 spies that went, 10 went astray, two remained loyal to the promise of Hashem, of Eretz Yisrael, which was a promise then and today, with all, whatever anyone says, God's word is going to prevail. And, and at, at that time, these two people, these two scouts, spies, were Yeshua and Kalev. Yeshua survived because of his Rebbe, because he was given a special bracha, a special blessing, as it says in the Torah, that Moshe changed his name. And Rashi, again, the foremost commentary, says that he changed his name in order to give him special power to have the resilience to overcome the environment around him which was indifferent or hostile to what the values that he believed in. What happened with Kalev? Kalev, our rabbis tell us, went to Hebron. It uses the singular. One of them went to Hebron, and that was Kalev. Why did he go to Hebron? In Hebron are buried our patriarchs, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, and Leah. And, uh, yeah. and he went there to pray to them and to ask for a bracha that he should have the power, the strength, to be able to overcome the influence of the others. And that's where he got that power from. And the Rebbe says two points about that whole story. Number one, it was not only that going to Hebron, it's like going to the Ohel, not only did he access the prayers of the patriarchs, but he himself became a better person the mood, the experience of being at the graveside of a tzaddik elevates the person to be able to accept that person as their rebbe. In other words, to be able to access their own innermost self. And the second thing is that there was a big rabble-rousing crowd, tremendously... Uh, rebelling against everything that Moshe said, and no one could get them quiet to say a few words. Even Yahushua and Kalev together could not get the crowd quiet. But at the end, it was Kalev himself that was able to get the attention of the people. Vayahas Kalev. Kalev silenced the people. And the Rebbe says that is because of the way that Kalev got his inspiration and power from Moshe compared to Yehoshua. Yehoshua was gifted the connection with the Rebbe. Yehoshua got a bracha from Moshe, and with that, he was great. Kalev is somebody who did not get that blessing. He went and sought it out himself. He went to Hebron, and he went and got the inspiration 
to be able to practice what he preaches, what his innermost self knew was right, and how to face up to an environment that is hostile to it. That he got because he himself did it. He was like the self-made person compared to somebody born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And the people respected it. And that's why he silenced them. That's what that ever says. He silenced them because they respected someone who worked on themselves. I compare it, Yeshua is like the Shaliach. And Kalev is like all of you. Kalev is like the normal people who were inspired by others. I myself, I used to be normal also. And you, you, you had that beautiful talk from uh, Rabbi Korn. You see someone, everybody, wherever they are, is able to reach it. That is what a Rebbe is. I want to tell you one more story. Is there time? Yes, I'll, t I'll give you the shorter version, but this is a beautiful story. It brought me to tears. Just happened in the last few years in England. But it starts about 60 years ago in a town in England where there are no, probably no black hat Jews. There might be some modern Orthodox, possibly a few. Not the big centers like London, Manchester, or even Birmingham. And there was a boy who was very inspired. And he went to everything Jewish, even though his, his upbringing was not so religious. And there, he went to the B'nai Akiva. That was the most religious thing available to him, the club. And then he went to their camps, and eventually, he went on Aliyah about 52 years ago. He went to Israel. He was young. He was still a teenager. He went to Kibbutz Lavi, it's an Orthodox Kibbutz, and he was so young that he was assigned sort of a family, a couple, to look after him. And then came the Yom Kippur War, just 50 years ago, a bit more. And he was one of the 3,000 holy neshamas that died. He had a sister back home in the United Kingdom. And she was so disillusioned, not by the religion, not by what had occurred. He died for what he believed. He died for his land. He died for his religion. He died for his God. But she felt that the community was insensitive to the plight of her own mother who was left without her child. I don't know what the details were. And she decided to reject anything Jewish, purposely made sure that she married out, made sure that she had nothing to do with the religion. And then Chabad on campus sent a shaliach to that town about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And the couple in Israel, now an elderly couple, who were the foster parents, phoned up to the shaliach and told him the story which I just shared with you and said, maybe you can seek out that woman, her children are Jewish, 100%. And he said, okay, what's her name? He got the name. Didn't know any address, any phone number, any Instagram or whatever, no account, nothing. He did his homework. He found out exactly where she lived, went to the house, and she allowed him. She said, my children live in, the, they're in their 20s. He has a son and a daughter. They each have their own apartment. They're working people. They were brought up to be polite, but you should know there has been zero Jewish education to those children. So you have a big task if you want to do anything with them. The shaliach went to this young man and brought with him what they call a term card. It's like a little folder 
and it says in England there are three terms every academic year, and it had a program, named it as speakers, for, and he said, come Friday night, you'll meet young people, you'll meet them, it's no obligation. And this young man, he's in his 20s, he said, I was in a synagogue once in my life at the age of four. On what occasion? He said, I don't even know. I was just told about it. Nothing. And it came Friday night. He, didn't, uh, he did not appear. The second Friday night, he did. And he just sat there without saying a word with his coat and left at 11, 12 o'clock at night and went home. Then he started coming to some afternoon sessions. Then he started coming every single Friday. At the end of the term, uh, in November, the Shaliach was coming to New York for the kinos, for the conference of Chabad rabbis. So he said at the end of the evening, next week I won't be here, we'll have a replacement, because I'm going to New York for a conference of rabbis. And this boy, this young man, stayed until everyone left. And then he approached the rabbi and he said, you're going to New York. Would it be appropriate for me to ask you to bring me back something? He said, sure, what do you want? He said, a picture of the man. He says, which man? He says, the man, he didn't know the name even. He, he said, the man who's on the wall in your house. So the shaliach said to him, shaliach told me this story just a week after it happened. He said, would it be appropriate for me to ask you why you want a picture? He said, I'll tell you. You came to me with your little leaflet. You know, in today's world, in the 21st century, everyone's handing you leaflets all the time. This one has a new phone program. This one has a new phone model. This one has a gym. This one has a diet. This one is tell telling you this group, and that's what's doing that philosophy, and here's the way, uh, all the latest fads. And you came with your thing. As far as I was concerned, it was just like everyone else. And I put it down, no intention to ever come here again. Then, two weeks later, a week and a half later, I was clearing out my flat, throwing out everything, and this was about to go to the bin, as they say in England. And I decided, just on a hunch, I decided to go onto the website of the Chabad house. And there was the man. And he was talking. And he was different from everyone that's ever come to me. Everyone's trying to sell me their thing. I felt that he was trying to tell me something about myself, how to bring out what I am. And I decided to test it, whether it's just a fluke or this is real. I came to a couple of other classes, and now I see it's real. So please get me the picture. When I heard that, I cried. Why? I am an educationist. This, is, this was about six years ago, so it's 24 years. I was here, Gimel Tammuz, 30 years ago. And I watched it with a low point, and I said to myself, Rebbe, I'm going to make sure every single Friday I have an assembly with the whole school to tell a story of the Rebbe. And I don't just tell any story. I tell a story which I feel will help them in their personal lives. Trying to get the young generation to relate. And here is a person who never knew an olive base, who never saw, if you go in London, you walk on the underground in the middle of town on Baker Street, you'll meet somebody with a beard and payas. But this person never, ever saw anything of Judaism. I found that later on he lived in an ex a very working class, totally not a single Jew living there. And he was inspired because the Rebbe helps you to access your own 
inner self. By the way, about a half a year later, a year later, I met the Shalia. On Pesach time, I had to call him. I said, what's happening with the guy? He said, he's still coming. Eventually, I'll tell you now, fast forward, this young man met a girl at the Chabad house from America, a student. They dated, and eventually they married about three, four years ago. And I have pictures of the wedding. Rabbonim were there, like very, uh, very top Rabbonim. And um, I to the Shuliach told me, I said, does he put on tefillin? He said he has a straight, direct connection to the Rebbe. That's his neshama. You go into his house in the neighborhood where you never would expect to find any Jew, let alone a, a, a religious Jew, let alone the Rebbe, there's one wall of his apartment which only has the picture of the Rebbe there. That's his inspiration. He puts on film when I come. But eventually, he got married, he has children, and he does put on tefillin, and he's running a family. I tell that story because it's telling us what it's all about. It's 30 years means that there's a greater opportunity than ever before. The Rebbe set us a goal, and that goal is to bring the whole world to the next stage of history. It's called Mashiach. It's called bringing freedom, liberation, fulfillment, alignment, harmony to all of the universe, to all of the cosmos. And we are the ones who are the players. And we are going to decide the pace, when it's, how long it's going to take. The pieces are falling into place. Any objective person sees it. But each of us can increase it, the pace, by being what we are. How do you connect to the Rebbe? Let me just tell you just a few tips. Number one, I, as a young Bacha, a young yeshiva student, in 1961, I was just before my 21st birthday, I was in Yechidus, in private audience with the Rebbe, and I asked the Rebbe, how can I become connected to you? And the Rebbe said, the way, he didn't use the word only, but that's the way of a real connection is through Torah. You study what I, what I learn, you'll be connected. That's one thing I can tell you, that to come to the Chabad house, to the classes, there were classes online in Hasidic teachings, in Chabad.org. There are classes that you can, there are books and tapes and all sorts of media today to be able to access the teachings in a regular way. Each person on their level. Whether or not you are Chabad, you can connect and you can be better, whatever you are, through a connection to the Rebbe. The second proposal, because the Rebbe said this many, many times, you want to do a personal favor to me, to connect to me, and I will do a favor back to you, connect to a fellow Jew, a fellow human. Help someone else. A friend of mine who is a Chabad rabbi, but he works on the administrative side of our foundation. So he deals, he went to the rabbi once and he complained, my friends, that this one's a rabbi, this one's a teacher, this one's a principal, this one's an outreach, this one's on campuses. I have to sit and deal with bank managers, overdrafts, financial problems, uh, looking after the building. And the rabbi said, you have something that they don't have. That's typical of the rabbi. You find the unique point about yourself. The Rebbe said they all know who they're going to, when they're going to teach, whether they're going to preach or to, to give a lecture. You are in your office, but by divine providence, somebody's going to come in there. Make sure 
you have a pair of tefillin and a few brochures or a little written in, in information in your drawer, you shouldn't have to go downstairs. And then, when anybody comes in, share something Jewish with them. So, every one of us, by learning, by sharing, become connected to the Rebbe. May Hashem help that we should see Mashiach Tzidkenu very, very soon. I think it, I just want to mention, I think we uh, extra thank you to Rabbi Teldin, who worked day and night and put this together. So thank you, Rabbi Teldin. So friends, thank you so much for joining us. And a big thank you, uh, yes, to Rabbi Teldin and the whole Vada Tzach and all, each and every one of the shluchim who uh, put together the groups, a very nice group here tonight, and each of you for coming out. I want to just say in closing, my own father-in-law, a Jew by the name of Rab Zalman Schmuckler, who lives in Los Angeles, California, and he has a custom for the past 50 years, 60 years, that every year for Simcha's Torah, he comes to the Rebbe, and the day before, Hashanah Rabbah, you go and you get lekach from the Rebbe, the sweet honey cake. And this was his custom when he was a yeshiva bacher back in the 50s. Later when he got married, he went on shlichus. And this did not change after the Gimel Tammuz, after the Rebbe's physical passing. They live in California. Every single year he flew in. He would spend Simcha's Torah here in New York. And the day before, he would come to the OL to get his proverbial uh, lekach. I'm not talking about the cookies, even though they're delicious. But the actual bracha. About five or six years ago, he was unable to come that year. Something was going on back home, and he calls my wife up, and he's feeling terrible. He never missed it. This is going on for, I don't know, 60 plus years. He says to my wife, Sotola, do me a favor. I'm going to miss my lekach. Please make a point to go get lekach on my behalf uh, on a Shana Raba. So my wife says, sure. We go anyway that day, and uh, we'll, we'll have your mind. So we announced in the house that morning that whoever wants to go, Tati and I, my wife says, we're going to go to the Yohel. One of my kids, my 10-year-old uh, son, Label at the time, says, I want to go to. So sometime that afternoon, we get in the car, Hashanah Rabbah, we come to the Yohel. And uh, on the way there, my wife reminds everybody, don't forget to ask for Lekach for Zaidi. Again, proverbial Lekach. We walk into the room out front where there's a video playing, and we're just minding our own business. And... Uh, I suggest you be sitting down for this. My label starts to scream, look, look at the video. We turn around, the Rebbe is giving lekach to my father-in-law. Now he is featured on one of the videos, one of the many, many videos, but at that moment, at that time, you are here and we are here at the gates of heaven and uh, obviously I'm told from Rabbi Refson, they organize ushers to help people go into the Yohel this is real, as you heard from Rabbi Korn, as you heard from Rabbi uh, Shmuel Lu, as you heard from the videos. I mean, this is your Rebbe. This is uh, about you. This is about bringing out this, the little Rebbe in each of us. And um, let's go get our honey cake. Let's go get our blessings. And um, as was said earlier by Rabbi Castell, the Rebbe wants us to grow as well. And I heard this fantastic story that the Shliach invited one of his yidden to go into Yechidus. Imagine if we could have a private audience with the Rebbe physically, which, please God, will happen very, very soon with Mashiach now. And uh, the truth is, the Rebbe said that the OL is exactly like that. You're going in. People ask me, how should I feel? How should I address the Rebbe? And my response is always, just like going into a meeting, because the Rebbe said that. But um, so the fellow was having a Yechidus, him and his wife, with the Rebbe. He was... Uh, you know, coming along, growing in Yiddishkeit, and he wrote a note to the Rebbe, as was customary, and he asked the Rebbe an interesting question. Could I consider myself one of your chassidim? And basically he explained, you know, we're on the path, I do tefillin, my wife does the Shabbos, maybe we do this, I don't know exactly where they were holding, whether or not there was Shomer Shabbos yet, but he says, I don't see myself anytime soon with the black hat and the shaitel. You know, never say never, but uh, I don't know. 
Could we consider ourselves your chassid? The story goes, when the Rebbe read that line, the Rebbe broke out in a smile and he said, any Yid who's willing to try to grow from time to time in their Yiddish guide, I'm proud to call them my chassid. Hello? But that's what the Rebbe is about. Any Yid who's willing to grow. I speak often for Crown Heights, Chabad groups, and Shluchim groups, and I say, and if we're not growing, we're status quo. Like Rabbi Lou says, if we're just born into this, not like the normal person, and we're just status quo, the Rebbe's not so proud. He's stuck with us. If you are taking a step forward, you could be at step one and you're going to step two, or step two and going to step three, the Rebbe is proud that you're his chassid. So that's what I want to suggest as a closing today from this extraordinary evening, organized so well with the speakers and the videos and the Chabad.org, and thank you those who are joining us. And this special moment, a day before the 28th of Sivan, such a miraculous, joyous day of the Rebbe and Rebbe's salvation. And as we prepare for the 30th yard site, may Mashiach come before then. Let's go into the Rebbe, whether it's tonight or if we're, we're going to go another time. But at the same time, as we ask for our proverbial lekach and for all the sweetness in the world, and as was said so beautiful by Rabbi Lou, the Rebbe empowers us to be the best we can be, materially, spiritually, in every way. Let's come to the Rebbe and increase one little bit. It's one little step. You know, we say in the Shema, love Hashem with your heart and all your soul. And what's the third thing? All your might. And it's always a question, what does that mean? And Hasidus says it means infinitely. How do you love Hashem infinitely? It's impossible for a finite being. The infinite explanation is anytime you go out of your comfort zone. If I'm not doing a certain mitzvah and tomorrow I begin doing it, that is infinity for me, and that is going out of my comfort zone. That's the next step. So let's think of that one mitzvah, and including in that mitzvah, as you saw in this extraordinary video, to share with another Yid. You know, Rabbi Shalom Berganzberg, who was an attendant in the Rebbe's house on a personal level for the Rebbe and the Rebbetzin, and had his own unique relationship, who recently passed away. Um, he related that he was once in the Rebbe's room, and uh, the Rebbe was, it seemed like, pacing the floor and uh, not so happy. And the Rebbe was like sort of musing to himself that the Rebbe said, Ich bin geboren geboren a Freitag. I was born on a Friday and I'm always late. And I can't get it all done. Something like that. And the Rebbe was sort of uh, uh, berating himself, so to speak, for not accomplishing his goals. And he felt very uncomfortable listening to this. And he felt like it was meant to be that he heard it. So... He's got to say something. Simple yid, but pure and real. Love the Rebbe to the nth degree. And as the Rebbe is berating himself, like, I have not done enough, etc., etc., he turns around and he says, but what do you mean? Obviously, he spoke in Yiddish. Look at all the shluchim all over the world and the bali tshuva, the people who you brought closer. And he says, when he said the word bali tshuva, the Rebbe turned around and said, no, good. Okay. I'm sharing it because I have chills when I hear that. Anyone in this room who has shifted in their life because of the man, it's because of you that he says, no, good. And if there's another yid in your circle that you can bring to Shabbos Lich, to Tefillin, to one little step, that's called the Baal Tshuva, and bring it into the Rebbe, say, Rebbe, Moshe, Yankel, Tzipora, Timothy, I don't care, is taking that one step, that is a step of Tshuva. And the Rebbe looks up and says, no, good and showers all of us with goodness. And let me close with this, because at the end of the day, as was said by every speaker, we need Mashiach, we need Mashiach. So, one of my daughters, today already a married woman, Baruch Hashem, a shlucha in Newark, New Jersey, but at the time, she was a young girl, of five or six years old, she was very afraid of the dark. And uh, she slept in her own room, and often in the middle of the night she would cry, I'm afraid, Tati, Mami, it's finster, it's dark, I'm afraid, and we would have to run in and out. And it became a whole issue. And we were worried about her and how we're gonna, you know, wean her off this. And then on some and we would go in and we'd say, Tati is da, mommy is da, don't worry, we're here, don't be afraid. There were some occasions when she would not be suffice with that. We said, Tati is here. I remember this vividly. She looked up at me, this little pure child, and she said, is bald for the morning? Is it almost morning? And I would reassure her, yeah, it's almost morning. 
Sometimes I think about that when I go to the oil and you think about the fact that at the end of the day and the darkness that we're feeling now around the world, and as Rabbi Korn said, clearly it's part of the narrative, but we don't see how. So when we feel dark moments, we run to the oil or we go to the shul or we open a siddur and we say to Hashem, I'm scared. Or we say to, Hash to the Rebbe, I feel lonely, it's dark. So it's finster. And we're reassured by Hashem, by his prophet, the Rebbe, Tate is with you, Father in heaven is with us, we're not alone, Hashem is not forsaking us. It's dark, yeah, but I'm with you, I'm watching over you. But then there comes a time, and right before Gimel Tammuz, 30 years, and we say to the Rebbe, and we say to Hashem, is it almost morning? Hello? Is it a time? And we stop saying that it's dark. Is it almost morning that we can finally say that it's dawn, and Hashem will bring home his people? And the whole world, instead of saying, look at these people, and who needs these people, will march and parade as we, together with the Rebbe and all the tzaddikim of history, will march together to bring the whole world to Hashem, to bring the whole world to the oneness of Hashem, speedily in our days, may it be soon, even before Gimel Thomas. Thank you all for joining us. We want Mashiach now.